Welcome back to the Daily Bread Bible Study. This is day 155 for Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020, focusing on Job chapters 35 through 38. Continuing with the discussion here in the book of Job, we remember that God is righteous, Job is righteous, and that Job is suffering. And so these things are held in tension with one another. We see here in this book that we're introduced to a man named Elihu, which means my God is Yah, or my God is He. And this Elihu reminds us that God is active and alive in the world. And so God is active and alive in Elihu as well, who speaks and critiques Job. Now, Elihu wants Job to change his tone especially his recent words asking why God allows the wicked to prosper while the faithful, specifically Job, suffer. Thus, in chapter 35, Elihu points out the impact that Job's actions have on the world around him. In Job 35.3, it says, If you ask, what advantage have I? How am I better off than I had sinned, than if I had sinned? I will answer you and your friends. And it Skips to verse 8. Your wickedness affects others like you, and your righteousness other human beings. Now, Eli, who references the communal oppression and communal sin, the way that a communal sin interferes with God's blessing upon those who are righteous and suffering. In Job 35, 12, it says, There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evildoers. Surely God does not hear an empty cry. I wonder if this means that uh, as, you know, the evildoers, the ones, you know, in this uh, positions causing evil upon others, uh, that they and their cries go up and get mixed up with God in the prayers of the righteous, and then, you know, God... Um, just doesn't hear it. Or if he's just saying specifically the prayers of the evildoers are empty cries, which I think is more likely. But in Job 35, 15, he says, because his anger does not punish and he does not greatly heed transgression, Job opens his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. So Elihu has already assured Job that God sees the wicked and the righteous, and will pronounce judgment accordingly. This will occur in God's timing, and not because Job wants the wicked to fall. Elihu calls Job's speech empty talk, which makes me think about our human tendency to complain when the way things are um, is rough, and we do this without seeking to do something about it. We just want to complain for the sake of complaining. We feel called to get it out sometimes. Maybe it's venting, which venting is okay, but it just goes out there. And what does it do? Nothing. Well, we become passive agents in our own lives, expecting God to pronounce judgment when and how we pronounce judgment. You know, we sit, we try and put ourselves in God's judgment seat. We can become disheartened when we model resilience in the midst of oppression. If we do it seeking to transform or change you know, the situation, to bring about justice, to bring vengeance, you know, might be a word that we could use to describe how we could turn injustice and uh, right the wrong. And it makes for a very good like video game or a very good movie uh, story plot, but at the same time, it's not... A, you know, a healthy model for us in our real world. We can fantasize about that, but you know, resilience is something to be applauded and to looked after and sought, right? It's hard to do. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But resilience in the midst of oppression can do something. Now, uh, let's just bring it to a couple of examples I was thinking of for our day and time, right? If someone cuts you off while driving, very simple thing to do. It's frustrating. It's not good. But if civilians, um, you know, civilians just aren't entitled to pull somebody over and, you know, give them a ticket, right? 
I mean, you could pull somebody over, have a stern talking to them, right? But um, currently our society does not have the authority given to those, you know, civilians, maybe in rare circumstances, but on the whole, it's um, something that our society delegates to police officers. Similarly, if my son steals a toy from my daughter, do I ask my two-year-old to recommend correction for my son? No, not really, right? She uh, might have an idea of how she wants to be helped, but you know that authority and responsibility to pronounce judgment really belongs to somebody you know with the wisdom to enact it. And so, you know, for my kids, they come to me to mediate that. But ultimately, you know, in our lives, in our world, we as people of faith uh, seek and turn to God for God's judgment, God's pronouncing uh, in situations. And so our role as, you know, Christians is not to enforce the judgment. We can be aware of the judgment for sure. We can know when things are unjust and we are called to, you know, um, remind other people that it is unjust, but our role is specifically to remind others of God's ways, right? God's justice, especially through proclaiming resilience in word and deed. Uh, I can't speak too much to this, but what's going on right now is still a lot of racial tension here in the United States. I, being a white dude, can't really talk too much about resilience against a, a system that favors me. Uh, but what I can you know, speak to say is that um, when I look and see the models for resilience, especially in the uh, black community you know, at this moment in time, it gives me hope. It gives me joy to see that you know, we can live out Jesus' uh, model for life-giving self, um, uh, you know, self-humiliating, um, I would even say, uh, ways to show peace and love and injustice in the midst of unjust circumstances. You know, for Christians, right, Jesus, who was not white, right, is the suffering servant who accepted the injustice of the cross, right? This Jew, this Middle Eastern man, um, used the cross to justify others and spent great effort after the resurrection constructing a resilient community of hope. He didn't go back to his disciples and say, you know, go kill the Jews who, who did this to me. Or, you know, or how can we establish a system, you know, that's going to, you know, favor the poor and oppressed versus establishing a, a system that, you know, cuts off the Romans in his day and time, you know, for example of that. But now Jesus didn't fixate on those who wronged him. He prayed for those who persecuted. He showed grace to those um, who did not earn it. Uh, the violence may mark and scar, which Jesus had wounds to show from his own you know, violent encounter with the powers that be. But it was his love and compassion that brought healing to his disciples. And it shows us the way to bring healing in our day and time too. Um, this is ultimately what Job will experience here in the story of Job, right? Love and compassion from God. So Elihu, you know, says and reminds Job of this in Job 36, 5. Surely God is mighty and does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. And so... From Elihu's perspective, even though he's not suffering quite in the same way that Job is, right? A lot has happened to Job, and Job, you know, has a right to speak it. But he also acknowledges that ultimately, you know, good will overcome evil. This, you know, this is the thing that we say and hope for, that God will in fact uh, pronounce judgment on the wicked, right? And you know, give deliverance to those who are right, righteous. Um, in Job 36, 9, Elihu continues saying uh, that Job has declared uh, to them their works and their transgressions and that they are behaving arrogantly, um, that God opens the ears uh, to instruction.
And so uh, Elihu continues saying that the godless do not call out for God's love and compassion, and so they perish. In Job 36, 17, but you are oppressed with the case of obsessed, sorry, but you are obsessed with the case of the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. Beware that wrath does not entice you into scoffing, and do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside, right? If God is going to show kindness upon, you know, the just and the unjust, and, you know, Job sees that the unjust are, you know, they are not getting their punishment that he thinks they deserve, right? Job is becoming obsessed with this point in the view of Elihu. And so Elihu is cautioning him against that, of trying to sit in that judgment seat and to you know, um, to neglect all of this. So he says in Job 36, 21, Beware, do not turn to iniquity. Because of that, you have been tried by affliction. Because Job is in pain, Elihu is worried Job will seek to inflict pain on others. Right? Um, our day and time, it's hard not to think to the rioting that has happened. You know, as I mentioned previously, there in the community that I was a part of, I was privileged to step in just a little bit of time with the community there at St. Paul Lutheran in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it was a privilege to be able to walk with that community as you know they um, suffered in some pain and some persecution, but that they you know s sought not to inflict pain on others. They sought to inflict hope, healing, love, possibility, even in the midst of adversity. And for that, I'm grateful for your model for resilience and love. And unfortunately, right now, you know, due to rioting, right, that community has experienced um, vandalism and destruction. And yeah, it's, it's just been hard to sit at a distance and, and hear and accept. So my prayers and thoughts go out to that community um, all those who are suffering and all those who are working to build a, a trustworthy society that we can live in, one of peace, equity, and hope, especially as modeled you know, by the, the, the model of the cross and the life-giving resilience that Jesus showed for us as well, too. So anyways, I, I digress. Going back to Job 36, Elihu then praises God and says in verse 26 of Chapter 36, surely God is great, and we do not know him. The number of his years is unsearchable. It is not stated here, but I imagine Elihu and Job are speaking, and while they are doing that, you know, a thunderous storm begins to brew and starts rolling into their area. And this is happening as Elihu is uh, celebrating how God provides storms that bring rain. So in verse 37, he's kind of mulling over where God is active and where Elihu sees God you know, working. He sees that through the storm and the awe that comes through that nature experiences. Um, you know, he, Elihu sees that um, that is connected with God. It says, so whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen, right? As it says, you know, in, uh, I forget the exact spot, you know, God causes the rain call to fall on the good and the evil. And so God is bringing about this rain. And Elihu then invites Job to reflect upon God's message in the storm. Um, in Job 37, 14, hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Then, as if by design, God speaks to Job. In Job 38, as Elihu referenced just minutes ago, God is going to use a storm, maybe even a tornado, right, to correct Job. It references a whirlwind here in verse 1 of 38. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, tornado maybe? Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. God invites Job to contemplate how things have come to be. 
in verse 4, where were you when I laid the earth and the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Continues, God continues in verse 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Verse 24. What is the way to the place where the light is distributed? In verse 34 of chapter 38. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? And in verse 30, 41, who provides for the raven its prey when the young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? Now we will see uh, through these questions, there's not really as much answers, but it's God speaking, right? This is the first time God is speaking and Job has wanted to God speak for this whole time. God, you know, is asking questions to Job that Job really shouldn't have an answer to. Also, I will acknowledge this, that God is not dismissing or acknowledging Job's point, his righteousness, his suffering, but rather God is opening Job's mind to a reality much larger than his individual perspective of suffering, right? God is trying to expand Job's mind to see what is actively at work in this world and the ways in which God is doing things that provide for life even in the midst of suffering. Next time we will continue to hear God speak and we will see what becomes of Job as we wrap up this book of the Bible next time. So thanks for joining me. Stay tuned for next week.